Proud presents Color Crossroads, a conversation on black mental health. Now, here's your host, Jonah Gilmore. Good evening, and thank you for tuning into this episode of Color Crossroads. I am your host, Jonah Gilmore. Tonight, we are continuing the conversation regarding black mental health. On our last episode, we discussed many historical concepts and ideologies that contributed to the black mentality as it relates to the ongoing global pandemic. But tonight, we want to push the conversation further and shed light on how the killings of people like George Floyd, Alton Sterling, and so many more impacted our mental health. Tonight, we will begin the healing process together. This is the aftermath. Before we dive into tonight's conversation, let's recap on the discussion from Candid Conversations. My colleagues Jaron Jordan and Tavarius Haywood spoke with history experts about black mental health, emphasizing that we have to understand our past to understand where we are now. Here's what you missed. I'm going to kick things off. Now, this psychological disturbance that we see today in many African Americans surrounding mental health did not come overnight. Can you talk a little bit about where we are now and take us back to the very beginning before our ancestors were forced to America? Yes, thank you so much for raising this because it is important for us to consider trauma on multiple levels. They know what, what it is and sometimes they need some guidance in figuring out what that crisis is and we're there to help them no matter the situation. And you all work hand in hand with uh, the police department here to try to not take so many people to jail if they're having a mental health crisis. Explain that process. So the process is we have what is called a no wrong door approach. During protests, you see the marches and hear the rally cries, but all of that, whether you're there in person or watching it from the comfort of your home, can take a mental toll on you. So much the mental drain can last longer than the protest. Joining us now is Eugene Collins, president of the Baton Rouge chapter of the NAACP. Eugene, thank you for being here with us today. Uh, thank you for having me today, Joan. Thank you. Now, hearing that the mental drain from protesting or even watching it can last for a period, you as a person who has been there, do you agree with that statement? Um, I wholeheartedly agree. When you look at sometimes the trauma that you experience in some of those settings, I, I could very well see that lingering on. Now, when you're there protesting, and you're there on the front line, what are you seeing and seeing and hearing? Do people openly talk about their mental health? Well, no. I mean, in that particular environment, um, there's a need to keep the, the, the task at hand, first and foremost. Uh, and when you're looking at the direct environment, um, at that moment, it's about the family that you serve. So oftentimes, your mental health uh, can't be talked about or uh, uh, put into that environment. There's too many things going on. Um, and oftentimes, I, I could see in some folks how that could create some lingering issues. And honestly, you, you've you been there. I mean, have you addressed your mental health? I mean, you're there on the front lines. You're seen there. You're there with families right after this. You're protesting with people in the community. I mean, your mental health is also important. So have you addressed that? Uh, most certainly. Like, when you... You look at the trauma that's attached to these things sometimes, uh, uh, especially when you, uh, like our president McClanahan often says, a first responder. Um, sometimes you're meeting with families before they even call their officers, right? Uh, so when you look at that initial trauma, that initial pain, uh, you're taking a lot of those things in. Uh, the pain that the family is feeling, there's nothing that could be uh, total equal to that. but. Uh, you're taking on trauma with each and every person that you meet. I, I can remember one uh, family I was helping some years back uh, when encountering um, the mom uh, in that family. The first thing I had to do was just stand in the parking lot with her. And I mean, she cried for about an hour before we could have a conversation. And that's something that sticks with you. Um, and there's nothing you can do to just push through that without seeking uh, the necessary help and not being afraid to talk to people and not wanting to have that conversation. And it's a, it's a tough one to have at times. Now, you said not uh, addressing that. In the black community, we know that, you know, talking about mental health, it's, it's, it's unheard of. We don't do that in the black community. How is it important to address the mental health in the African-American community? Oh, mental health is so key, right? We oftentimes just look at mental health as 
something taboo or something in our community that we can't touch or is very touchy to bring up. When in reality, we need to be having these conversations all the time. I think at a point uh, in our history, we would refer to people as crazy. Some of the derogatory terms that we say we just didn't know any better. But today we know that some people just need a little extra help or somebody to talk to. And we can't be afraid of having those conversations around mental health. And you said people just need somebody to talk to. Experts say that for protesters, managing their mental health can come in the form of self-care, soul care, or collective care. I mean, what are some things you do? Ah, uh, man, uh, probably not enough of it, man. But I'll I, I tell you, man, some of the things I do is get out and uh, play with my kids. Uh, you know, the, the, those kids and running with them and my daughter, uh, who was coming up and extremely intelligent, uh, bouncing things off of her, I find that therapeutic uh, for me. Um, and I try to get on the golf course, but I'm not as good a golfer as I would hope. So sometimes that adds to uh, the, the negative stuff within my mental health when I'm hitting it bad. Now, what advice do you have for others who are battling with mental health issues from seeing things like police brutality? Seek help. Don't be afraid to talk to somebody. Um, being a part of those things, there is a lot of trauma attached to it, and that's not nothing to be ashamed of. You should seek out help and seek to talk to somebody and seek out the appropriate help as well. Uh, we had mentioned that at any Jonah, but seeking out the, the folks with the letters behind their name uh, to su support what they're talking about and making sure that you take care of yourself in that process because you can't be any good to anybody else if you're not taking care of you. And that's a good thing. People need to take care of themselves. Thank you so much, Eugene, for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Now, experts recommend avoiding activities that can trigger anger or pain, doing things like taking a break for a day, meditation, therapy, and, or journaling can help. Coming up later in the show, we talk to a therapist about ways to help you cope. As a journalist, we're taught to not become the story, be objective, don't show your emotions, and only tell the facts. Often, when reading stories about black men being killed at the hands of police, emotions are bottled up and pushed aside. The same can be said for black attorneys who become the faces of these cases. Tonight, we sit down with attorney Ron Haley, who knows that feeling of having emotions restrained at a time when emotions are running high. I've cried with families before, folks that have not met, but you have a sense of connection of the the loss that they have had. Attorney Ron Hilly is often the first one families call following officer-involved shootings. Oh, you move on, shoot your hands. Put your hands on. One of the hardest things for me to do as an attorney is to walk into that living room that initial time after a loved one has been killed at the hands of the police and to hold the hand of, of a mother, uh, to put my hands on the shoulder of a father, to hug a, a child, um, a relative, friends, and they're looking for you for answers. As a lawyer who represents families of people either killed or beaten at the hands of police. When I'm talking to the governor, when I'm talking to the chief of police, when I'm talking to the district attorney, I don't want to hear that I am sorry. He sees the trauma firsthand. Devastation, confusion, despair, grief, anger. And you have to be able to manage all of those things all at the same time. And oftentimes you're getting that smorgasbord of emotions from not just you know, it's not just one person being the angry person, one person being the person in grief. Oftentimes, all these emotions are are built up inside of everybody that you're meeting with. For him, a black man, he shares the confusion, grief, and anger as many black people feel across the world watching these videos. It's hard to, to sit there for hours at a time and just, you know, the utter grief that that they're going through to uh, just the human side of you to, you know, not want to do what you can to em embrace them where they're at. And that does get emotional at times, but we always and say we attorneys like myself that do this type of work, um, 
have to remain in control of our emotions because they are looking to us to guide the ship. You said a few things. You said, one thing you said was you're guiding the ship. Then you said you're taking your emotions and you're bottling them up. You talked about being put on national platforms. When you take all that to account that you're being a leader of this ship, you're bottling up your emotions, you're on a national platform, honestly, and I want, to, I want you to be honest, do it take a toll on your mental health? It takes a toll more on my sleep than, than anything else. Um, there's times I have difficulty sleeping because my mind is, is, is constantly racing. I mean, I've been put in a position to help a lot of families, and I think for me it's not just one case. Right, it's all of the cases, you know, combined. It's, it takes its toll because, as I'm, when I'm pulled to be 100% for somebody in the moment, I know at that time that I'm not doing something for somebody else, and that's what really gets to me is the fact that I can't be everywhere, and I can't be any every, I can't be I can't be everywhere, and I can't be everything for everyone. Um, and trying to manage that and expectations is probably the hardest part to me because I, I want to help people. I want to help everybody that, that comes in and I don't want to fall, uh, fall short of that. We've seen this play out over and over. Black man after black man killed at the hands of police. Here locally in Baton Rouge, we have a police department that have been transparent about a lot of things. You have spoken with Chief Paul, I have spoken with Chief Paul. He always talk about a healing process and moving forward. What does a healing process and moving forward honestly looks like to you? I think there's a case by case basis and I think there's a macro healing process. I think from a case by case basis the sooner that the family can get to the truth um, they can begin to have at least some sort of closure for the family themselves. I know in the case of Trayford Pellerin in, in, in Lafayette, Louisiana it was a police shooting case um, where Mr. Pellerin, almost a year ago, um, actually a little bit after, longer than a year, was, was shot and killed when he was shot between 11 and 12 times uh, walking away from police officers. Um, they had to bury Trayford um, without having any of the body cam footage. That was hard for them. Um, and I don't want and this is a point I really want to make for the people that are watching this. If you recently lost someone, or anyone out there has recently lost someone, a big part of the healing process is the funeral. You, the, the wounds never close, whether it's a death that is expected because of an illness or age or something that has um, un unexpected has happened, such as an, an accident, right? Um, there's a, a bit of closure with getting to the funeral and laying your loved one to rest, knowing what the cause of death actually was. When it comes to cases involving law enforcement taking the lives of, of people, and knowing that the evidence a lot of the times is is put on the shelf or suppressed or not immediately released. You have these families that are burying their, their loved ones, but still it is unclear as to what happened. And so at that time during the funeral, like you don't get the same closure that other people get who's lost loved ones um, for various reasons. And so the funeral isn't closure for them. In the wake of officer-involved shootings, there is often an instant sign of separation between black people and law enforcement. You hear the talks about the necessary steps in rebuilding trust with local police departments, but what does that look like? Licensed therapist Shamara Howard now joins us to talk about how we begin to bridge the gap and seeking help regarding our mental health. Thank you for being here with, today with us, Shamara. Now, I really appreciate you joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So we want to dive right in. We want to get to the experiences, yes, right? What yes. do black people say about their experiences with law enforcement? Black people say that they're tired. 
As it relates to their experiences with law enforcement, they have been from the womb to the tomb seeing and hearing about the inequities as it relates to their treatment. And black people are tired and they're ready to see changes happening since yesterday. And you say see changes happening since yesterday. I mean, what do change even look like at this point? I love that question. I love that question because I'm a change agent. And I love that question, Jonah, because change for black communities who have been targeted uh, by different law enforcement agencies, again, for so long, they want to see a change in the way they're treated from law enforcement. They want to see a change in the way they are addressed. They want to see a change in, in the way they are processed and handled in the judicial system as a whole. But they just want to see more relationship building with law enforcement. And you say relationship building, that, that relationship or that lack of relationship that you see between black people and police, it, it, it creates more issues in the community. Absolutely. There is a lot of distance between the community and law enforcement and police officers. And what we know about relationships is when we give them too much space and too much distance, they go away. Like they don't live well with too much distance in relationships and with any relationship, we need connection. And so that's what black communities need from police and from law enforcement. They need a connection, a connection that's built on mutual trust, transparency, accountability, and responsibility. And I will say, living here in Baton Rouge, this has been one of the police departments I have seen that have been very transparent when it comes to these issues. That's the thing that people want to see. Chief Murphy Paul has been very clear and very vocal about being transparent, being honest, and letting people inside and see what's actually going on. I mean, that's what people are really looking for, and that's the, the thing that brings them in and say, hey, I can trust Baton Rouge Police Department. Absolutely. Here, people are feeling a little more safe. We do always look for uh, ways to change and improve and improve the processes with people. But we have to go into the communities where people are affected most and ask them what change looks like. And then we have to get with professionals who are change facilitators to help create systems that can promote more accountability with our systems. Now, moving to a different uh, a different talk here, the mental health side of this. Obviously, seeing this, you and I as black people, we see this time and time again, black people killed at the hands of police. It takes a mental toll on a lot of people from your clients. I mean, what have you been seeing as far as their mental health is concerned? Mental health is in shambles right now, especially with the black community. So in 2019, Black people between the ages of 15 and 24 died by suicide at the highest rate ever. And so that lets us know that black people are in a mental health crisis. And because of a lot of the turmoil that's been happening and that's been seen, we now see people being killed at the hands of police on social media and online. And that takes an additional toll on people's mental health and the way they interact in the world and their quality of life. And so I'm seeing that in the office and so many other therapists are seeing clients having so much anxiety and stress going about their daily lives worried is my child going to be next is my husband going to be next am i going to be next so people are afraid we're now living in a generation where you see a lot of people are vocal about things you see a lot of people go out to protest but you also see a lot of people now seeking help when it comes to mental health something that has been taboo in the black community for so long absolutely mental health isn't as taboo as it used to be however it's still a bit of a stigma in the black community because a lot of us come from the era where you don't talk about what happens in this house. What goes on in this house stays, stays in, in this house. house. <laughs> so you've heard that as well. And so, however, as a therapist who just two th years ago, my practice serviced over 90% white clients. So my client base was specifically mostly 90% white clients. And then as of like a year later, that's, that shifted to more 90% black clients. So we are seeing a shift in what therapy looks like for black people. And honestly, you just said something. You said, you know, you and I grew up where you don't talk about mental health. I mean, when you had that shift from your 90% white client to uh, client base to black people, I mean, what was that like for you? Was that a shocker to see that more black people are actually seeking help? More black people are actually seeking help 
because now they're seeing that there are actually black therapists. So there are about 3% of black psychologists, right, in the United States. And so it was definitely a boost for me. And I was like, yes, this is what people need to see people who look like them, who they feel like can hear them, see them, value them, and most importantly, understand them. And that's something people who may see this can think about. You know, a lot of people still don't know that there are resources out there for them or they're still skeptical about going to seek help to, you know, get their mental health Absolutely. in order. I mean, for those people that see this, I mean, what do you tell them? Don't be afraid. Come in. It's, it's a safe space. We don't bite. <laughs> so that's one of the things we tell people is no. People want to know that they can trust you to not tell their business, right? People don't want to know that if they're scrolling, they're going to see themselves being exposed online or they're going to hear their conversation. So what we do is we build trust with people. We build a rapport with people to let them know that this is a professional relationship. We set boundaries to delineate this professional relationship with us that you might have with any other person. And so that's what we tell people. You, It's a it's a relationship that's built on mutual trust and understanding. And most importantly, it's not about my advice. It's about your issues. And so you are the main character when you go to therapy. Your therapist is there to help guide the process. But it's all about you. I like to tell clients all the time, therapy is like this. The way I conduct therapy is we're in a car, okay? It's your car. I'm driving but you're the one with the directions. So in order for us to get from point A to point B, you have to guide me. However, since I'm the licensed driver, I have to follow the rules of the road. There might be a stop sign I have to stop at. I might have to yield, and I might have to make a U-turn based on what's happening in traffic. Now, when you think about mental health and people going to therapy, you think about things that can trigger someone. Mm -hmm. For people who are going to therapy and they're still watching these incidents incidents mm -hmm. where you have black people being being harmed at the hands of police I mean what do you tell them do they turn away from looking at this or I mean what, what do you tell those people I emphasize the importance of protecting your space the importance of self-care we've glorified and romanticized what self-care looks like to the spa treatments and the trips but self-care is actually stuff that you do on a daily basis that contributes to your overall well-being and watching people being killed people hurt and harmed all day it takes a toll on your mental health so you're absolutely right we tell people to cut your screen time don't it. Put limits on what you're doing online. And we, I'm sure you have a list of resources for people. If someone sees this and they want to seek help, I mean, what resources are out there for them? So there are tons of resources, and a lot of people don't realize that although there are some inequities as it relates to insurance and treatment, your insurance covers mental health treatment. So call your insurance because a lot of people worry about payment for therapy, but your insurance pays it. There are other state programs. But if you're looking for a therapist, especially one who looks like you, you want to go to either therapyforblackgirls.com, cliniciansofcolor.org, or therapyforblackmen.org. And here in the Baton Rouge area, where can we find you? Well, you can find me on the green couch, of course. So chat at onthegreencouch.com is where I can be found. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. We really appreciate you with these resources and all this information. Of course, my thank pleasure. You. Thank you. And you can find the list of those resources right now on the website. That's brproud.com. We hope that tonight's conversation does not stop here. Share what you learned tonight with your family and friends so that we can begin healing within ourselves and our community. For myself, my colleagues, Jaron Jordan, Tavorius Haywood, producer Stacy Richard, and all of us here at BR Proud, we thank you for your continued support and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, good night.